Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, guest speakers, and Senior Parliamentary Secretary for Sustainability and the Environment, Bae Yam Kang, our guest of honor, for taking the time to be here with us this Friday afternoon for the official launch for Sustainability Exchange Season 3. My name is Erin, Program Manager at EB Impact, the nonprofit arm of Eco Business, set up to create and deliver programs to Asia Pacific's underserved communities. We are excited to share with all of you the exciting plans we have for the upcoming season of Sustainability Exchange. Sustainability Exchange is a youth mentorship program curated for youths in Singapore to drive capability and knowledge development in the areas of sustainability. The initiative has also provided a platform to forge meaningful relationships among promising individuals in the public, private, and civic society sectors that will provide fresh and new thinking on green growth and sustainable development models for Singapore's future. I would like to start off by thanking our strategic partners, Meta, who has come on board to support this initiative for a third season. OCBC Bank, who are also returning as strategic partners for a second season, and new strategic partners, SG Eco Fund, for all your support. I would also like to thank Tomasic Shop House for being our venue sponsors for this event and for providing this beautiful space for us today. Today's proceedings are also being live streamed on Zoom. I hope you can all participate in today's lively discussion by adding your thoughts into our chat boxes, and we will also have an interactive Q&A session later during our panel discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Diane Anderson, Associate Director at EB Impact, to give the welcome remarks. Thank you, Erin, and good afternoon, everybody. Senior Parliamentary Secretary for Sustainability and the Environment, Mr. Bae Young Kang, distinguished speakers, guests, and our EB Impact community, a warm welcome to you all. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon for this special occasion as we mark the third season of the Sustainability Exchange Program. Allow me to share a little bit more with you about the history of this program. The program was dreamt up and designed and launched at a time of the global pandemic when it was gripping the world. One one, of the, one that would bring, so we wanted to create this program during a time when there was a lot of uncertainty and fear. We wanted to create a program that would inspire action and agency. One that would bring energy of youths and channel it towards solutions that would support us in reaching the sustainable development goals. Hence, the sustainability exchange program was conceptualized and it focused on youth and education two out of the three of EB Impact's strategic focus areas, the third being nature-based solutions. In the first year, we had an overwhelming number of responses. We had set an initial target of 50 youths, but we were overwhelmed with a number of applications of 146 youths, 59 mentors, and a, from a wide range of organizations from all different walks of life. In our second edition, we received 200 applications and we onboarded 43 youths and 11 mentors, where these 11 teams then focus on finding solutions to, to support Singapore's green plan. In the past two years, the program has allowed for 32 wonderful creative solutions to emerge and which ranges from food waste management to enhancing sustainable sustainability reporting to accelerating sustainable innovation and development in Singapore. And many of these organizations are still underway, having secured funding from a wide variety of different sources, some of them of which you will hear from later today. Along the way, the EB Impact team has gained many lessons, what worked and what didn't work. Together with our strategic partner, Meta, who has joined us in this journey from the very first season, we took these feedbacks and these insights from our pilot program and we incubated it further. We, we want to thank Meta, the Meta team, who are not here today, unfortunately, for their support in this meaningful program so far. Alongside this, in the season two edition, we also secured funding from OCBC Bank who funded five of the top projects from the season two edition. 
I would like to thank the OCBC team for being a wonderful strategic partner so far and for again committing for a second year running up to $50,000 to up to five teams for this coming season. Today, we are also excited and proud to be launching the third edition of the Sustainability Exchange with three focus pillar areas. Our first pillar is the continuation of our youth mentorship program. Our second pillar is the new and new involved capacity building program where, where this year we will be running three workshops with the support of our strategic partner, MSC EcoFund, to upskill youths on sustainability and sustainable development topics. And our third pillar is the alumni network and CSO exchange network to build a stronger community of sustainability professionals in Singapore. We will also be focusing on measuring our impact and the outcomes on this program from season one, season two, and season three. And we are excited to be receiving applications from youths and mentors for this edition. Applications will officially open today after this event. We will be assessing the application and selecting participants by April. And, and the six month mentorship program will begin and, participate, and participants will be onboarded into this program by end of April. I'd like to conclude my remarks by thanking our strategic partners, Meta, OCBC Bank, MSC EcoFund, as, as well as the Climate Action SG Alliance, SPS for Sustainability and Environment, Mr. Bayam Kim, and our academic partners, NUS, NUS Center for Climate-Based Solutions, SUSS, Cambridge Center for Advanced Research and Education in Singapore. And of course, our venue sponsor, Tomasek, Tomasek Shop House, for hosting us in this wonderful location today. And of course, I would like to thank our EB Impact team and our Eco Business team for putting all their hard work together to bring this event together. And thank you all again for joining us today. And I hope you find the conversations today very fruitful and exciting as well. I would now like to pass it back to Erin. Enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for opening up today's program. I'd now like to invite our guest of honor, SPS for Sustainability and the Environment, Mr. Bei Yam Kang, to give the opening address. Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I'd like to um, give myself a little pat on the shoulder because uh, that's just my little contribution to this uh, event. Uh, I took the bus here just now, and I'll be taking the MRT back to my MSC office in uh, Scotts Road. <laughs> oh, I must do more. So must we all, right? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to, to launch the third season of the Sustainability Exchange. I'm glad to learn that this initiative uh, has grown over the years um, and uh, continue to groom our youth uh, to be ready for the green transition and a low carbon future. Many of you would need no introduction to climate change and its devastating effects. With extreme weather conditions getting more frequent and intense, the need, the need for climate action is more urgent than ever. Globally, climate action has been gaining momentum, but more can be done. Based on the report released by the United Nations last year, the world is bending the curve on greenhouse gas emissions downwards. However, we remain on track for 2.5 degrees Celsius of warming by the end of the century. Actually, not really on track. Lah. It's not on track. It's off track. Right? We, are, we are heading towards 2.5, so we are off track. And so this is a distance away from the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius target uh, under the Paris Agreement. So despite contributing only 0.1% of total global emissions, Singapore is a very small nation. We are still very committed to doing our part for the global climate action. In 2021, we launched the Singapore Green Plan 2030, setting ourselves bold and ambitious targets in sustainable development. Last year, we raised our climate ambition to achieve net zero by year 2050. And we are among 
the few countries to submit our revised, nationally determined contributions ahead of COP27. With these goals and plans in place, we are now pressing ahead with actions. For instance, the carbon tax will be progressively increased from next year onwards to encourage adoption of low carbon solutions and improvements in energy efficiency. We are also implementing the disposable carrier bag charge from July this year. Uh, this we hope to promote responsible consumption of our limited resources. The world is transitioning towards a low carbon economy. It is estimated that industries driving the global shift to net zero emissions could be worth up to $10.3 trillion by 2050. Singapore is riding the wave and enhancing sustainability as a new engine of growth. This includes positioning ourselves as a carbon services hub, a leading centre for green finance, and regional centre for developing new solutions. As we move towards the green economy, it is essential that our current and future workforce are equipped with the necessary skills and knowledge. Under the Enterprise Sustain Sustainability Programme, the government is working with industry partners to help companies develop capabilities in sustainability. We are heartened to know that leaders in their respective fields have come on board the programme to share their expertise and experience. Beyond developing our workforce, we need to build a pipeline of green talent that can ride on this momentum to accelerate the transition and to sustain our development towards a green nation. We have seen efforts to impart relevant skills and knowledge through formal education in the institutes of higher learning, but it is also imperative that youths are provided with the opportunities to address sustainability challenges in the real-world context. I'm heartened to know that uh, EB Impact has been actively empowering our views and developing their skill sets through its various initiatives, including the Sustainability Exchange um, and now into its third season, the mentorship program has been a platform for youths to learn from sustainability professionals. This year, it will focus on addressing challenges in food production, urban planning, tourism, technology, sustainable consumption, and education. And all of these are very relevant to the Green Plan. So I'm glad that MSE's SG Eco Fund is a strategic, strategic partner this time. So I know that Sustainability Exchange Season 3 will include new capacity building and networking components that will bring our aspiring use solutions closer to fruition. Right? It's not just about planning, about the passion or interest, but it's about action. These sessions will benefit both current and past participants of the Sustainability Exchange. I urge youth and industry professionals and practitioners to sign up and be part of our larger continuity movement, our larger community movement to advance environmental sustainability in Singapore. Singapore is committed to doing our part for climate action. We have set ourselves ambitious goals and targets and are taking concrete actions to achieve them. As we transition to a low carbon future, new growth opportunities will arise. Our current and future workforce need to be equipped with the right skills and knowledge to leverage these opportunities and remain relevant in the green economy. Our youth, who are our future, we need to be given the opportunity to develop their capabilities, whether through formal training or hands-on experience. I thank EB Impact and your partners for your continued 
dedication in nurturing our views, and I'd like to congratulate you on a successful launch, and I hope to see many responses right, from the community, the youth, and the industry. And over the long term, I hope our participants and mentors will apply your solutions in the community for greater impact. And to support you, the MSE SG Eco Fund is available. We are here to provide resources for our participants to realize their projects developed through this program. So I'd like to thank the Sustainability Exchange for helping us uh, to draw good projects, groom them, uh, tap on the SG Eco Fund, and we do more for our sustainability journey. So with that, I thank you, and I look forward to a meaningful afternoon with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, SPS for Sustainability and the Environment, Mr. Bei Yam Kang, for your opening address and for taking the time to join us today. I would now like to introduce our next speakers, Li Zhe Lo and Kimberly Go, alumni youth participants from Sustainability Exchange Season 2. Alongside their team members and mentor, their team under the project title Ecologue were one of five teams that were awarded funding from OCBC Bank at Season 2's two's, season two's final showcase. Since then, they have also gone on to obtain funding from the Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment's SG Eco Fund as well. They are here today to share about their solution devised under this mentorship program, their journey and experience, and their plans to implement their project. Over to you, Kimberly and Lise. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm, I'm Lisa and this is Kimberly. So we are part of Ecolog. And here we want to share a bit about a project that we, that we came up with uh, over the past season of uh, Sustainability Exchange. So uh, given the problem statement from Eco, uh, EB Impact, uh, we actually devised an idea that we want to leverage on technology to democratize uh, climate decisions. And we'll uh, shortly share with you uh, what's our idea. So um, actually we, what we wanted to do first is actually get a sensing of what youths um, thought about how are they currently engaged with sustainability. So we should ask them whether they lead a project on um, climate uh, awareness, whether they are currently uh, joining seminars, upskilling themselves in terms of knowledge, whether they follow the news, or perhaps they do not even do uh, such uh, engagements. So we should be understood uh, what, what their current uh, level of knowledge and their engagement currently is, and should these the results that we got. So actually, we can see that actually quite a large range of people actually follow the news, but perhaps how do we get them to take the next step and actually get onto more um, action-based approaches, right? So I think this is the main target audience for our project. And so actually, we analyzed the problem and we saw the problem of engagement as something that is perhaps, um, this we broke it down into these three areas. So transparency in terms of how, how do youths and uh, consumers um, actually engage with businesses and whether there's transparency with the how businesses engage with sustainability, whether there is a consistent engagement with their consumers, um, through a back and forth dialogue and a sense of ownership for the environment um, from consumers. So tr through identifying uh, these three kind of problems, we actually came up with our idea, which is Equalog. So we want to leverage on technology to um, actually help to fill in this gap. So I'll pass the time on to Kimberly to share more. Okay, so with Equalog, we are looking at three main um, prongs of our approach, which is firstly participation, transparency, as well as capacity building. So with citizens themselves, we would like to allow them to have the platform to initiate their own projects, as well as be able to engage with companies, which I think is quite um, a rare feature. Um, and in doing so, like maybe in the instance, if let's say you're a professional with like environmental um, experience or more technical type of expertise, you can sort of work with companies to um, further their sustainability agenda and goals as well. Um, and then for um, companies themselves, right, we want to act as a middle ground for them to connect with like citizens and in particular youths themselves. Um, and in by doing so, we want them to also showcase like more accountability for the work that they do. Um, and ultimately, I think with Equalog, our main aim is to create like a public think tank of sorts, which is like entirely run by citizens and companies themselves so that they can take a, like, have a sense of ownership in whatever they do. Yes. Okay, so this is actually 
um, just uh, some screenshot of our team. So last year, um, yeah, because we did this project last year while it was during COVID, so we didn't actually had have much chances to meet up, unfortunately. But I'm pretty sure with this year's sustainability exchange, um, with the restrictions lifting and everything, um, more youths can probably <laughs> meet up with their mentors online and grab dinner or something like that. So this was um, us during our fi final pitch um, at Crane Living. Yeah, so actually just, just to give a short sharing, I think because we were we actually first met each other, we were complete strangers, and we actually met each other. And then I think the beauty of the sustainability exchange program is that the diversity of youths, because I come from my environmental studies uh, sustainability background, can be comes from more of the marketing background, whereas our next team member, Tian Hui, who is not able here to be here today, she actually comes from the business background. So I think the synergy of having that di diversity of um, knowledge areas actually is what helped us to actually come up with different perspectives of how we see sustainability and kind of propose our ideas. So actually, how did we get from here? Uh, on the left, where we were really strangers, and then we, we actually came together to come up with our project. And um, so, yeah, we actually really enjoyed the project, and I think I'm really looking forward to the capacity building sessions that um, is in this uh, season of EV Impact. I think capacity building in terms of um, how, how do we budget, how do we structure our, our, how do we make sure that what we propose is sustainable. I think that's really key, and I think I'm really heartened by what EV Impact is doing to develop um, the program to strengthen the capacity building for these participants. So you see here us on the right with our mentor, um, who, is, um, who is a professional in the sustainability space. He's, she, uh, he is a, Hatch, uh, he's a company called Hatch Blue, so um, he really has experience um, doing implementing, helping startups uh, in the aquaculture industry. So we actually learned a lot from him, and I think, yeah, we all benefited from this. I think there's a lot of mutual learning as well, because um, while we learned from him, I think we also shared some of the, our more use, youthful perspectives to him as well. So yes. Um, so actually, just to wrap up, I think we want to really show that our diverse interests actually what is what gives us strength. And I think, um, yeah. So I think thank you very much. And I think if we're actually very happy to share more, if more details about our idea, um, you can approach us um, later and perhaps you can also reach us on LinkedIn. So uh, much thanks to Benedict and the EB Impact team for organizing the last season and looking forward to the alumni networks and I think interacting with the youths uh, in this season as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lidze and Kimberly, for your sharing. I hope that their story and their journey also inspires some of the youths and mentors in our audience today to also apply for this upcoming season. I would now like to introduce the dialogue session for today. This panel discussion brings together youths who have founded their own sustainability initiatives, focusing on waste management and environmental education, as well as an advocate who rallies communities together to tackle the littering issue in Singapore. We are also joined by a season two alumni mentor, a seasoned sustainability professional and academic. Joining me on the stage, please welcome Gerald Yep, Yasser Amin, Dr. Gadgil Abiruchi, and Cassandra Yip Lee, as well as Diana Anderson, who will be coming back to the stage to be moderating the session. Thank you, Erin, uh, and welcome everyone <laughs> again. Um, good afternoon again to everybody here. Um, I think there's a lot of familiar faces on stage here with me and also in the room as well. So it's really great to see everybody here for this conversation this, this afternoon. I think what's really great about uh, who we have on, this, on the stage here today is we have somebody who has actually been a mentor for the Sustainability Exchange Program. And we also have young, young people here who have done amazing work in Singapore and the ecosystem as well. So I'm really excited about this panel. Maybe before I go straight into it, I'll give a little bit of background about uh, this panel discussion and why we brought the different, the different people on stage here with me today. So I think we are living in a time where environmental degradation and climate change really sits at the forefront of the national agenda, the regional agenda, and of course, the global agenda as well. In addition to that, advocacy and, and activism efforts towards more sustainable future, we're seeing more and more of it is being done by youths, and more and more of it is being developed by youths and implemented by youths in innovative solutions that seek to address climate change issues. However, the issue that we also see is, is that youth-led innovation is in fighting climate change really remains to be undervalued and also underfunded. 
Uh, youths are driving, for, uh, driving force towards sustainable development. However, they're, they are really navigating a rapid changing world. Hence, there needs to be more support for them and really needs to empower, th more, more uh, agents out there to empower them forever as well. So with that context <laughs> in the back, I, I think this conversation is really a discussion to understand what will it take for youths for, to drive sustainability innovation and how can we best support youth-led action to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So let's get straight into it. I would like to first maybe go down the line here and introduce my panel of speakers. Maybe um, just share your name, uh, where you come from, and why you're excited to be here with us today. Maybe Abhi, we can, we can start with you straight away. Sure. Uh, so I'm Abhiruchi Gadgil. I'm a research fellow with Cambridge Cares. Uh, it's a center for CO2 reduction. Um, I have been a mentor in season two, as they said, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience as Ecolog shared as well. Um, the diversity of you, the raw energy has been infectious and they have so much to offer. And I think all it needs that a little bit of support from different parts of the society, maybe a little bit of funding, maybe a little bit of uh, expertise sharing, and it can really propel a lot of beautiful solutions for uh, the society. So I think that's why I'm here and I'm ex super excited to be a part of it. Over to you, Yasser. Hi, Tess. Okay, hi, my name is Yasser. Um, so I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer at Stridey, managing and leading the team. Um, how I started in sustainability, I think I'm blessed to say that for me the start was pretty easy. All I did was to join a beach cleanup session. And, and I'm sure a lot of you um, might have experienced a beach cleanup session. So for me on that day, I, I saw that number one, there were people who take their free time out to do this on, on a Sunday morning. And I believe it was National Day. Um, number two, I saw the environmental degradation that was happen happening on our shores. So for me, I found it really easy to be, to be compelled to do something more, which is to organize um, weekly cleanup sessions. So I quickly found that as a way for me to contribute in, in the local sustainability scene. So I found it really my, 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 my space to be a community organizer. And one way or another, I'm now leading Stridey, which is um, looking at inland waste management solutions. Um, particularly littering, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Gerald, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Gerald. Uh, I am, um, how do I put this? Uh, I'm the, lead, I'm the uh, product innovation lead uh, and the co-founder of Simula. And what we do in Simula, as you can see from my shirt, uh, we collect plastic waste, we break it down, and we turn it into uh, useful products that you can use. And uh, if you want to have a look at what we do, there's uh, two tables over there and a couple of stools that we did. For, for forward coffee, yeah. And um, yeah, so I think how we started, or how I started on this journey, uh, it started all the way back when I was in primary school. I think I was quite lucky to, um, to kind of find my path very early in life. Uh, and um, yeah, all the while I've been very interested in, this, in the environment and finding ways to um, you know, make an impact. And uh, along the way, we, I made many different friends and uh, different contacts uh, who are now uh, part of my team over there, there are two of them over there. Uh, and uh, yeah, they actually uh, showed me that, uh, you know, to, do, um, to drive impact is not just about, uh, it's not just like one dimensional or two dimensional. You have many, many different aspects that you have to uh, fulfill, right? And one of them is actually um, the commercial aspect. And that is why we decided that uh, for us to be able to drive um, a lot of impact, uh, we started a company um, that would focus on creating alternative materials for people uh, you know, to use. So it's not just about diverting waste, it's also about giving people an option to use something else from your standard like concrete or, or, or you know, virgin material basically. Yeah, so that, that's, that's my story I think. Yeah. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Cassandra. I am a final year environmental studies major at the National University of Singapore. Uh, on the side, I'm also the founder and CEO of Earth School Singapore, where we run environmental education lessons for children and youth. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here today to kind of share more about being a youth environmentalist in Singapore and how we can create more opportunities and champion uh, that for a bigger audience as well. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, and thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, maybe before we get started, I'm going to ask the team to put up the Slido slide up on the screen. So if you have any questions throughout the session, please do pop them into the, into the Slido. And this goes for those of you online as well. We will get to them at the end of the session as well, OK? All right, let's get straight into it. So as you can see, we have a very exciting panel here. So maybe this first question, I'm going to pass it over to Cassandra and Gerald first. As youths who have founded your own initiatives with Samuela and Earth School Singapore, what inspired you to pursue the, these ideas? And what have been your biggest learning points in the process? Maybe, Cassandra, we can start with you first. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think Earth School is really a manifestation of my two loves in life, which is the environment and really working with children. Uh, it was my COVID baby uh, when we were in lockdown and I was thinking what could we do with all this free time and that's how the idea of really running a school for environmental education really came about. Uh, it also stems a little bit from my own experiences growing up in Singapore. Um, my parents were actually avid environmentalists. They met while scuba diving so I grew up a lot by the beach and out at sea. And I never felt that it was really an opportunity to become an environmentalist in Singapore, uh, not until I reached my undergraduate level when I found that, you know, we actually have so much to conserve and so much natural heritage here. So I think that's how our school stemmed to be. Oh, I think we've been about, we've been running for about two years now, and we've definitely run into a lot of challenges. Uh, but I think the lessons learned from these two years is really that really not to you know give up on your dreams and you have to be resilient in your goals but also at the same time to be adaptable and flexible in the ways about how you achieve them uh yeah i think those are the my main two learning points um, thank you <laughs> uh yeah so um, i think for for myself uh, like i mentioned earlier uh, my whole journey started when i was in primary school and i would i think it's quite a strange story. Uh, I think I was in primary three or primary two where my teacher was telling us, oh, you've got to save electricity, you know, because you've got to run out. And at that point in time, I was thinking, oh, no, if there's no more electricity, I can't play Pokemon anymore. <laughs> so I decided I, I need to think of a way to find a sustainable source of energy. Uh, yeah, primary three, I, I couldn't think of anything, right? Uh, but, but for some reason, that, that thought stuck with me um, throughout my education uh, journey. And um, I was trying to figure out a way uh, all the way, right? And, uh, but as I progressed along, I realized that um, environmental issues are not just energy related. You know, there's many other things that we need to consider as well. And um, yeah, so we tried many things at the start. Um, I had a, a very small team at the start. Uh, it was just myself and another guy. We were trying to make icons, you know? Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have enough technical expertise to do so. Uh, and um, Actually, a lot of credit to where I am today. It goes to one of my team members. Actually, he's sitting there with a very nice batik shirt. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, he was he's straight from my reservist, actually, eh, from my um, NS days. Uh, and I met him in reservist, right? The first day, first time I met him in reservist, I told him my story. Uh, second time I met him, I told him the same story. Then he said, why are you telling me the same story again? Let's do something. <laughs> so, so I like, okay, okay, let's, let's try something, right? And um, we realized that the current idea wasn't working. So we had to pivot a bit here and there. And uh, moving from one idea to the next, we finally came across um, something that we could do, right? Um, and that was the most important for us because we wanted to get something off the ground quickly and uh, something that we could uh, you know, quickly drive some impact there. And that was uh, plastic recycling, right? Uh, we came across a video by Precious Plastics on YouTube, uh, learned some of the uh, you know some of the things that they were putting out there, and we we saw that hey, you know there's some kind of a uh, uh, space here in Singapore that we could uh, fulfill, uh, and um, we decided to just try something. But that of course led to many many years of still trying. That was like 2017, 2018, I think, and um, we were trying until around like 2020 or 2021, uh, where the more I think the more senior people uh, came into the team, right? I say senior in terms of age, lah. Right, so uh, I think all of us. I mean, at the point in time, we were all kind of in the same age group, you know, in the same uh, mindset. And I think the good thing about this was uh, when our new members came along, they came along with the experience that they brought. You know, like thirty, I think uh, thirty, twenty years of corporate experience. 
uh, they actually understood what was required to push this into uh, actual business. And, um, yeah, and I guess along the way, we still made a lot of uh, amazing partners uh, that helped us to uh, you know, find our footing and all that kind of stuff. And I would say one of the very heartening things that we learned was that um, there is a cry by the industry for sustainable solutions. Uh, at first we thought, oh, we're going to have a problem trying to find people to wash bottles and give it to us. But actually, uh, there were people saying, hey, do you take my bottles or not? Right? Or, um, yeah, can I give you my bottles and that kind of stuff? And they were all very willing to wash them. Uh, a lot of credit goes to Forward Coffee as well, because uh, they're one of our first partners, uh, and uh, we, they, they are still giving us a lot of their bottles, uh, so we're very appreciative of that. And that has allowed us to, um, yeah, I guess, grow, you know, and uh, of course, uh, hopefully continue to grow <laughs> and uh, com continue to drive uh, more impact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you both for sharing. And I think it's quite interesting that the both of you really kind of stems from your early years and your childhood, kind of that interaction into sustainability, into the environment is, is very core and very important. Maybe we can take a step back now and really kind of understand a little bit more what are some of the opportunities for youths to develop new sustainability, sustainability innovations out there. We're, and maybe I'll pass this question over to you, Abi. What are some of the opportunities for youths to develop new sustainability innovations? Where are the gaps in the market for youths to come in and contribute their ideas in? Honestly, the gaps are everywhere. So I think wherever you are, whatever you're studying, there is a very high chance that you can come up with a project or an idea or a solution which can uh, essentially be uh, in sustainable, ha involves sustainable mindset, so to say. Uh, that being said, um, as uh, Gerald just pointed out, that uh, uh, it's um, the the point is here is uh, that I think sustainable consumption that is one really good area because uh, people are wanting solutions. Uh, they want to really, they are aware, as I think OCBC study showed a few years back, that uh, the S Singaporean society is extremely well aware of the problems in sustainable sustainability or climate change. The point now is to how, for, uh, how should they adopt it? So I think that translation of how to adopt the solution, uh, anything in that area, any project in that domain would really be useful for uh, encouraging adoption. Um, another would be, I would say, sustainability communication. I think there is a huge opportunity to com communicate sustainability in a good way because there is a lot of panic. There is a lot of there are a lot of questions. So if youth can come up with and there is a the youth are, have the pulse of the society. They are the ones who are going to you know uh, the next generation who is going to face the brunt of it sort of. So taking it out in a positive manner, taking it out in a way where people can start adopting it. Sustainability communication education. What she is doing. There is a huge gap in sustainability education as well. Uh, so I think all of these areas uh, which are all and and technology. Technology, of course, technological innovations are um, definitely the sort of the deep tech uh, is really, really going to be important because uh, I, and I think universities support that. Lots of university um, uh, courses are uh, coming up for that as well. So I think all of these areas are definitely worth exploring. Yeah. Thank you, Avi, and I think some of these areas we will be exploring <laughs> in season three of the Sustainability Exchange. Um, maybe this could be some advice for some future participants out there. And Gerald, I'm gonna I'm gonna arrow you for this two-part question. Okay, so from the first part, from your perspective in scaling Semula from ideation phase to now a fully operating company, what are some of the challenges you faced? Okay, um, so I think some of the challenges that we faced uh, very early on uh, was to get projects, right? I think um, if you don't have projects, you don't have uh, people buying your stuff, then you don't have a business, right? So I think for, I think for the youths out there who are trying to do something, uh, that you, I mean, trying to start something, um, the most important thing for you to do is to really find someone who is willing to take the, that, that first step with you, right? To get a project done, and uh, to get something done, basically. You, know, um, you can do all the planning you want in the world. You can sit there and think about, oh, you know, I need a HR department, I need a finance department, and all this kind of funny stuff. But as long as you don't sell anything, you don't have a business to run, right? So that is very important. And that is also where you need to start to think about what are you trying to sell? Are you trying to sell something that you want 
or you know sell something that the the the, the consumers want, right? Because I mean I think that if I put it into an analogy, right? Uh, everybody in this room, I don't have to convert you, all, right? All of you are already uh, climate people, right? You believe that you need to do something for the planet. I think the people that you need to think about very um, uh, clearly, you need to ident identify are the people who do not believe in this uh, movement. Those are the people that you need to reach out to, right? And um, you may you may want be wondering how do I do that? So if I can give one more example, um, I just want to ask. I mean, if you can answer and just shout shout it out, lah. Do you think Apple is an environmental company? Apple, sustainable company? No, right? They make phones. They make phones and all that kind of stuff. But I will tell you right now that they did something that was very, very good for the environment, and most of us don't even know what they did. And that was they invented iTunes. Oh, okay, iTunes is shows how old I am, but Apple Music right now they use. Right? Because once they invented iTunes, or once they started to launch that, nobody used CD-ROMs anymore. CD-ROM, CDs anymore, or, the, or whatever thing that they use, right? And that eliminated so much waste. Eliminated so much waste in the environment. Then it came Steam. If you, even you play games, right? Steam is another digital platform that you can go there and buy games on. And I don't think that the person who invented Steam was sitting there, I'm going to save the environment. No, they just thought of a way to deliver a service or a product to the consumer in a very um, efficient way. And by doing so, you convert even the people who don't care about the environment. So I think you're yeah, like sneaking, sneakily trying to convert them, right? Which is in a way what we believe uh, to be the right way uh, for us to run our business, which is why we focus a lot on the material that we are building, on uh, material that we are producing. We're trying to ensure that the material is something that designers or architects want to use because it looks good or because uh, it fits their purpose. And then we will tell them, oh, by the way, it's green. And then they walk, yes, I can get the certification, <laughs> right? So, so um, I think that is very important. Yeah, I, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, yeah. no, um, maybe just kind of bringing a more general angle as well. What do you think are some? What do you think are some of the obstacles that are currently standing in the way um, in, in for youths to develop their ideas further from ideation stage? Because I think. Luckily, I'm still a youth, so I can say this. So, <laughs> being a youth myself, I think I have all these ideas, but sometimes just getting the idea out there is quite difficult, right? What do you think is, is stopping stopping that? Ah, I see. Okay. Um, so I think uh, in terms of challenges, uh, many youths may, that may face. I, I, I don't know about many youths, uh, but when, when I was a youth, hopefully I'm still a youth. Uh, the challenges that I, I faced myself uh, was um, trying to do everything uh, by myself at the start. Right, or having a team that wasn't diverse enough, uh, that we could all bring, a, bring on board different ideas or different channels to get things out there. Right? Um, and also not knowing kind of like the structure of how to do certain things. Because, um, I mean, for us, we are a product company. We have been testing products for a while now. Uh, and um, I think one of the fears that we had was, are we breaking the law or not? <laughs> right? like we, like one of our earlier uh, ideas was actually to try to um, convert uh, coffee waste or coffee grounds into like um, uh, what like combustible um, briquettes, uh, is it briquettes? Briquettes for, for, for barbecue or whatever, right? And uh, we were doing that, we were, we were worried that we were breaking like some fire code or something. And uh, so we, we scrapped the idea after my, co my neighbor complained that I was smoking up her house. So, <laughs> so, so we, uh, yeah, we, but I think those, were, those are some of the challenges that uh, many of us would face. Um, we, are, we are not um, sure, or I wasn't sure of what kind of regulatory uh, uh, restrictions there were, uh, and I didn't really have a team like, at that point in time. And slowly, you know, as the team uh, grew and, and people from different backgrounds joined the team, uh, things got much easier. Um, yeah, I think, yes, that's, that, those are the <laughs> two main challenges. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and sharing your experience as well. Yes, sir, maybe uh, I'll move on to you now. So someone that's been in the space for a while, and I think you, you, you're very much entrenched in the space, how do you think youths are contributing to climate action in their regions and in their communities? That's a good question. Um, so, so if you look at the region and compare it to Singapore, it, it gets quite different. So in Singapore, I think it's, um, we all know that the political climate 
might not be the most accommodating for quote unquote hard advocacy. Um, so in Singapore, when it comes to advocacy work, climate action, it might look different than other countries. You know, we cannot do um, rallies, for example. And then in Singapore, you can see some innovative ways that climate action shows up. And what I've been introduced to at the start was just how welcoming the community has been when it comes to online advocacy. So a lot of the first friends that I made in the community scene were people who are doing amazing work in um, Instagram. So climate action and climate uh, communication through artwork, through advocacy work on Instagram. And that was one thing that occurred to me at the start because when we see news articles about climate action, climate work overseas, you don't see just um, posts that, that go around. What you see is on the ground action. So for me, that was interesting to see. And that helped me translate my work in, realize my space in climate action um, because what I did and what I still do is organize beach cleanups. But at the start, it didn't occur to me that that was climate work. But the fact that I brought together a bunch of people um, in the climate space, that, that got me to realize that that's actually climate work. Um, so yeah, that's been very interesting to see how that differs from overseas. So yeah. yeah. Thank you, Yasser. Maybe we can just uh, stick with you here and uh, Abi, maybe you can chime in on this as well. Which interventions or support do you think are required to scale up and sustain the kind of these contributions to climate change and sustainability innovation in the space? Mm. So early on, we were wondering if, if policy work is, is it, it does a, a lot of work in this, but we sort of agree that interventions in the form of um, resources um, directly uh, enabling youths, that's where it, it helps the most. And one good example is what Sustainability Exchange is doing. Another example I thought of was how YSLE, Youth Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, how the direct resources from US Embassy comes into the region and enables youths to, to be exposed to many different situations and learn a lot. I think that, that those are one of a few ways. And SPS, you mentioned about SG Eco Plan. That's another great one that locals can apply for and receive resources that fund their initiatives. Yeah, Abi? Yeah, I think in terms of interventions, these are the things where we are um, essentially forming youth communities uh, and, you know, on organizing more youth conferences, you know, getting them together on different platforms such as sustainability exchange and a lot others. Uh, in terms of policies, uh, nothing concrete. Uh, I think it's hard to pinpoint something, but I think there is, has to be a um the youth have to have a seat at the table so to say and i recently uh, read this term called youth washing like the green washing and what it is called it, it essentially means is that we are kind of including youth but not really giving them enough attention or we are not really taking their uh, opinion so seriously so i think that needs to sort of come down as the youth are, of course, youth need to be mentored and groomed as well. Uh, but I think there's so much that you can take from them and they can be a huge part of forming policies. So I, I think that should be, in, in terms of policies, I think giving them a seat at the same table in some different form, that would be a, yeah, an option. May I add on to that? So, so from what I've mentioned, I'm giving youth a seat at the table. From my personal exp uh, experience, it's been very heartening to know that government organizations, they're very much um, open to working with youth. Um, for example, dialogue sessions with MSE. Um, for Stride, the, the data that we collect for cleanups, when we visualize data impact or impact through cleanups, we're able to go to Public Hygiene Council, we're able to go to National Environmental Agency, we're able to work with them and, and see how we can better enable these data to, to, to to solve certain issues. So, so it's very heartening as a youth to see that government organizations are open and welcome to these many different um, collaborations and um, feedback from the youth. So I think that's very important. And I imagine it might not be the same in many other regions around the world. So yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Yasser and Abi. And maybe Abi, uh, I'll stick with you because I think you've been in this space for a while and you've done quite a lot of research around it as well. What, do you, what are some of the approaches do you think that have been actually successful? I think, uh, again, I'll point back to uh, sustainability exchange again, uh, because it's one of its kind. And uh, uh, so I think the approach where it works for youth is to have a diverse team. 
you need to have make sure that the as he said you know the moment the seniors came into picture there was a different sort of expertise that came in so you have you need to have a team from dis different perspectives um, you also need to have financial uh, support of course uh, and uh, strong uh, i think strong community where the community is trying to adopt the solutions that youth are trying to uh, sort of give as well i think there has to be that uh, there is normally we always talk about uh, support from the society from the governments and institutions or corporates but i think uh, sustainability is just one one of those topics where you need support from the community and you need to have uh, that as well so yeah thank you abi Cassandra, I'm going to come back to you. I think uh, being somebody that's still in university and you've had great success in kind of bringing your voice out there and, and bringing kind of more of youth voices out there as well, I think it's become very apparent that youths are actually quite concerned that their con contributions made by individuals were, were insignificant compared to the actions taken by corporations and, and governments. I think as somebody that's been in this space for a while now, what 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 do you think stands out about youth's, uh, youth p young people's vision for climate change and how can we ensure that more of their voices are heard? Definitely. Uh, first of all, that's a, that's a really tough question. Um, I, well, I had a professor, uh, Professor Michael Maniatz, who's down at the Yale and US College, and he coined this term called the individualization of responsibility. And basically what it talks about is about how big corporations, governments, uh, instead of looking at their internal policies or the way that they do things, they instead shift the narrative onto their consumers. Uh, why are you not recycling more? Why are you not you know, taking more public transport? Why is it on me and what I do, right? Um, and I think a big part of you know, amplifying your voices is that we stop bickering among ourselves as well um, and, and stop subjecting one another on what it is to be a perfect environmentalist or to that blame game between us. And instead, you know, empower one another to really, you know, grow our impact and take part in each other's, you know, um, activities and initiatives as well. Um, and I also think that's what's the most special about being a youth environmentalist and having a voice um, at this age. Uh, I think that really goes down to going, boils down to us really being perhaps very woke about things, uh, that our viewpoints and our um, ideas about what is right and what is wrong is not set in stone. And we have a lot of ability to, or we have the capacity to really learn more about the in intersections of environment and really help each other, you know, champion that a little bit better as well. So yeah. Thank you, Cass. Sorry for the difficult <laughs> question. I think you answered it beautifully, though. So, yes, sir, I think this is my final question for you. I think youth, uh, youth and climate action does not necessarily have to involve innovation or ideation of new solutions, but it can also, more, more importantly, have also advocacy to it. What are some key challenges to climate action? Given such challenges, what support is required for youth to participate effectively in climate action from an advocacy perspective? Mm, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so I always feel like when it comes to advocacy and, and, and com um, sustainability co uh, communication, the reach seems to always stop short of people in the sustainability scene. And so it, it gets a bit harder to reach out to the uninitiated. And that's something that I've always struggled with because it's always the same people turning up for the same beach cleanups, the same um, sustainability events, so it's the familiar faces all around. Um, so that's where I think I, I'm still struggling with, how to reach out to this, um, especially youths. Um, and, and it doesn't always have to be an innovative solution. Sometimes it's simple solutions. So one thing that I always go back on is um, when, when I'm thinking of this issue is there's, there's this um, term or idiom in Malay, it's called tak kenal maka tak cinta. And if you translate it to English, it means you can't love what you don't know. So, and also Gerald, you mentioned something about um, sneakily um, getting people on board. Um, I found it very easy to sneak that in because people turn up for beach cleanups and the, the focus is beach cleanups, but they're also experiencing nature. 
So I'm a strong advocate for like letting nature do the work to initiate people into sustainability. Because if you go to any nature location and you see the net, um, the, the degradation that, that, that happens, people, I think they realize. So that's one easy way. And, and it's a simple solution, I feel, sometimes. So yeah, I, I, in my way, I just get people to do cleanups and they care more about sustainability. And the thing is, like for corporates, they always have um, certain um, hours to clock in, certain CSR hours. So that's, that's how we get them hooked on to, yeah. No, it's, it's very true. And if you want to set up a cleanup, please hit up. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sir. Um, last question here before I pass it over to our audience. If you have a question burning inside of you and it's on the Slido, don't worry, we're going to give you a chance to also ask it here. Um, Abi, I'm going to come over to you. Um, as a previous mentor in the Sustainability Exchange Program, what support do you think is needed to haunt the skills and capacity of youths to become leaders in the sustainability space? So I think the two most uh, sort of obvious answers are mentorships and funding. Uh, that's definitely there. But uh, I think uh, another skill set which is kind of necessary across all sustainability professionals or not, uh, whoever is trying to uh, come up with a project in sustainability is sort of exposing them to what we call systems thinking. So when, whenever you're planning any project, you, you, we need to uh, sort of educate that we need to uh, see the project from cradle to cradle. We really need to make sure that every aspect from the sourcing of the materials to where the waste is going needs to be taken care of. And uh, so I think that one of the, it's sort of a capacity building as we, we are thinking about as well. Uh, another thing is to understand whenever you are again, you, you want to go out and as he said, you know, you want to tell them if it is, uh, how, how does it impact the environment? How, what is the profitability? So you need to make sure that the youth uh, know how to calculate the impact, impact on the environment, impact on the society, impact of the economics. So you don't see the project in one funnel of e economics, but you intentionally talk about environment and social aspects first because you can always come up with the, uh, with an NGO concept you don't have to come up with a solution which is a co you know business solution as such so intentionality in terms of bringing in the environmental and social parameters I think is super important and to be educated the uh, um, across again across all disciplines domains it's a commonality that can uh, bring in. Um, and, and of course, I think the uh, um, funding like SGE co-fund and more of those uh, would help. And mentorships, which are uh, deeper, longer, uh, because I think a lot of good solutions come over a period of time. They don't come overnight. So we really want uh, them to start off uh, on a ground, like solid footing, but then you want them to have lasting mentorships. So good mentorships program across uh, like EB Impact and then further on, maybe corporates can take it up or some other institutions as well where they are lifted up and the project is enhanced and you know deepened. Thank you, Avi, and thank you for panelists. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to the audience. I think Erin has a mic or not, <laughs> uh, but if anybody has any questions in the audience, uh, let me know, otherwise I can go into the Slido. Any takers? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, I think I'm gonna go with this question. I, I thought this was quite an interesting question. I think this more goes to the, the three youths. Share the biggest challenges that you faced in the first three months of, of starting your organization and, and how, do you, how did you overcome it? I will let whoever wants to answer, answer. One, one challenge immediately popped into mind. And so, so what I still do is um, communicate about um, environmental cleanliness, be it whether it's your urban locations or um, coastal locations. So one thing I found, and, and when it comes to climate communication, there's a lot of emotions involved um, in order to communicate effectively, at least it is for me. Um, so I, I found it a bit hard to communicate my emotions and put it out there. And, and maybe this ties in with um, eco-anxiety. So I, I found it really hard to put into words what I'm experiencing, what I'm feeling, and what people should do about it. Because as, as someone who's starting and, and seeing um, just how big the issue is, for me, it was quite scary. 
Um, and, and to communicate that fear was really hard. So I think that's something I, I faced early on, which maybe in a sense I'm still facing, but I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I've seen with like the other organizations here, it's really impossible to do it alone. Uh, I think when we when I first thought of Earth School, the first three months was really thinking about who can I ask to be part of my team and can really join in this effort and really trying to communicate what our school is and what it stands for to these people and convince them to come on board with me. Uh, I've had an incredible team since then. Um, but yeah, I think the first three months was mainly about building up your own internal capacities. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I think I share many of the same challenges that the both of you faced. Uh, so I'm not sure if I can give a more unique perspective, uh, but, but I'll try. Okay. So um, I think one, um, one of the other challenges that we face, because I, I, I think I mentioned earlier, like, uh, uh, you know, this, this has been going on for some time. And uh, um, actually in, I think, 2018 or 2019, I can't remember the year, maybe 2017, can't remember the year. But uh, uh, we, my, my team and I, that time were just myself and one guy, uh, we got a grant from um, SIT, uh, Singapore Institute of Technology, uh, to do like a prototype for the aircon, right? And at that point in time, I was working a full-time job, and I thought that, yes, I've made the big time. I'm going to go in there and resign tomorrow. Oh, what a bad mistake. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so, so I did that. I resigned. Uh, I thought that now I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to go and, you know, go and IPO in the next year, <laughs> right? And then... Um, we tried that for a while, and I think the biggest challenge for the first three months was to find work to do, right? So, so I, I, that was, I think, also a very big learning for myself to, to, to understand that, uh, you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, business is, is, um, is more than just an idea that you come up with. There's this, this entire ecosystem, this living thing, there's everything that, there's a lot of things that you need to put into it, and you have to make sure that, obviously, you've got work to do. <laughs> if not, you're just sitting there burning your, your capital, right? So I think that was, yeah, that, that was one of my biggest challenges, I think. Thank you. I think I'll just take one more question. Oh, do you, would, oh. <laughs> I'll just take one more question uh, from, from this. And I think this kind of leads up to what, what we've discussed as well here, right? Adding more team members, making sure that you're allowing there to be diversity in, in your team. Um, so with more and more personalities joining your team and your organization, what are some measures that you put in place to ensure that there's continuity in your organization and in the work that you're, you're currently doing? Um, I, I, mean, I think you maybe can share a little bit <laughs> as well here, um, especially with, with the sustainability exchange uh, program as well, and then maybe I uh, can pass it over to them. So yeah, I, I think uh, the diversity was actually the USP of our team. We I absolutely enjoyed all the team members. Uh, they gelled well together and not out of fluke, I would imagine. Uh, because I think they came, they all brought their unique perspectives to the project. One was from social uh, work background, one was from business, one was from finance, and one was from engineering, which are extremely diverse topics and uh, to come up with a solution. But they, uh, I think the, it was, I'm saying it was not because of a fluke, because uh, they had a common, uh, extremely com common thread, which was uh, the, their, their love for nature or doing something. There's a sense of purpose. So they had a huge sense of purpose and that tied them together and they were just uh, you know, snowballing after that. So uh, I think the moment you bring diverse teams, you what you get uh, in a sustainability program or a sustainability project, if they are passionate about sustainability, you get a team which really brings in unique perspectives. And um, I, I shared with him uh, incidents just a few minutes back uh, before this session was that the, uh, the student who was uh, doing social work, she, was, uh, she always brought about the perspective of uh, what, what does it do to, the, do to the society. Any project that we talked about, we talked about a 15, 20 projects and we narrowed down over a period of time to one. Uh, so her question always was what, what is it in for the society? 
and which was beautiful because everybody had to think deeper as to oh wh what is it what is it uh, for the society here so i think that's that's what diversity brings when you have common passion diversity can go really wrong as well if you have very very different personalities and no common thread to take them along but i think uh, in projects like this where they have a common pa passion it works beautifully thank you Any, anything to add uh, maybe i'll add something uh, I think um, for for ourselves in Samula, uh, uh, we one a few ways that we tried to do uh, that we I mean sorry that we tried to um, maintain the cohesiveness cohesiveness of the team uh, was to ensure that all of us had the same goal, same passion, uh, and the same kind of uh, values, right? So um, I mean you definitely all the pers all our personalities will be different. Right, but the most important thing is at the end of the day, after you know, even if we had an argument or or we did not agree on certain things, uh, we can always fall back on to so what are the company values, right? You don't you don't cheat on your own values, right? You just uh, you know fall back on that and and we can come to agreement based on that. Uh, another way is uh, try to eat lunch with your team. <laughs> so uh, we eat lunch in a lot. Uh, thankfully, you know uh, most of our uh, team members. Um, like I said, they're mostly from the senior category, right? So they got a lot of rice cookers and microwaves to donate to us. So yeah, we regularly cook in, and um, I think sharing a meal uh, together with the team actually really helps you to have some common uh, ground at the end of the day. So uh, maybe you cannot eat lunch with your team members, never mind, do something, right? Uh, and that will be where you get to know each other, not as a colleague, but as a person as well, right? And you get to understand. Sometimes your colleagues may not have a you know, maybe last night their their two year old woke, woke them up. Uh, you can't expect them to come in while they smile very happy. Yeah, no, right? They, they, you must understand. I mean, from that kind of perspective, you get to understand the person, and you also get to understand that it's not personal. Right? Don't take things too personally. Right? We just um, try to be open minded, and uh, yeah, through that, I think uh, having a diverse team, um, you are able to accept the different kinds of uh, personality traits that we all have, uh, but at the same time also tap onto each other's strengths and uh, move forward to that common goal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. A anyone else wanting to add anything? I think I've heard passion, <laughs> and I think that's great to hear as well. Would you like to add uh, anything, Cass? Yeah, perhaps I'll share a little bit. Uh, as a youth fund organization, I think my entire team are all still in school. Uh, it's great because not only do I get to work with, you know, um, such incredible and bright minds with so many incredible ideas, uh, I think the team challenges each other. We're always asking each other, why are we doing this? What is the purpose? What kind of impact will we have? Um, and is there a better way to go about doing this? Uh, we've had several projects come in. We've closed projects um, and we've always learned from that. We've redeveloped that, uh, improved on that. And, you know, there's always a bigger thing and a bigger goal to work towards. Um, but also, I understand as a student myself, uh, the beauty about running a youth fund organization or in a startup style is that we can afford to uh, have certain, um, we can afford to uh, give them a little bit more leeway, you know, among our, among our team, you know, if we have assignments coming up, if it's exam season, uh, or if we have other personal things to attend to. And I think the team works well in the way that we support one another, we pick up the work here and there. Um, for each other to kind of achieve our goals. So yeah, that's, it's been fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir, would you like to add anything? Um, I think for me, recently I found the magic of um, flexi remote working. And that's been the same for the rest of the Stridey team. And I'm saying this not as an, uh, just our oh, flexi remote is the best way to work. And you no, know, everyone has their own. But what I found is I am my best when I'm allowed to do everything else other than sustainability work as well. So I cannot be focused entirely on, on, on sustainability because I need to take my mind off things. And I found that my other team members find the same way as well. They feel the same way as me because they have time for other things. Um, and, and to add on to, to your point, that, that f remote flexi work comes with lesser physical meetings, but physical meetings are very, very important. That's how I see um, uh, my team and that's how it happens. Um, on a holistic view, climate action is even more of climate action when you come together physically. I, I forgot that when it, come, when it, it was during a COVID season, um, but now that things are opening up and events like this are happening, I feel like collaborations are happening more 
because we're seeing each other in person and I really, really like that. So, yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think I'm just gonna end it with one final question and we'll, we'll make this snappy and, and quick. I think, wh what is it that you wanna say to other youths out there on how to get involved in, in the sustainability space in with an innovation that they may have? What, what is that? One, I guess, one thing that you want to share with them. Maybe we can start with Cassandra and make our way down here. Um, I know this might sound a little bit cliche, but there's no better time than to start now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think um, if you are a youth with an idea uh, and you want a place to start, uh, you don't know how to start, right? So uh, one very good place to go is go to your local... Um, Town Council or RSC, you know, or CC or whatever, you know. Uh, many of them actually have green groups, and uh, we have, I mean, we've worked with many of these green groups, so we know. And um, they are always saying that, oh, we don't have young people anymore. So all the young people out there, <laughs> if you have anything that you think you can contribute to, that's a great place to start. And also that's a place where you get to learn about um, uh, access to all these different grants, different kinds of um, uh, help uh, assistance kind of schemes that help you to uh, get started on a, on a journey. Right. If your objective is to start something, that's the best place to go, I think. Yeah. Oh, you already have that. Sorry. Um, I, I think that many youth might be a bit hesitant to start doing sustainability work or contributing because they might not feel like it's impactful or they might not feel like what they're doing is right. But uh, what I want to say is that just take a leap of faith because you never know what happens and, and how impactful your, your contributions are. And no one is a perfect is the most perfect um, environmentalist or sustainability person. We just show up in our own ways and our best capabilities and we do what we can. And, and I think that's what more youth should, should realize. Yeah. I will stand for the academia and I'll say do a PhD <laughs> because I think there is so many projects and there is so much funding available right now for uh, anything and everything sustainability, really. There is every single field you can think of, there is enough funding for you to really go in deep, find solutions over a period of time, and produce amazing works. So I, that would be <laughs> my <laughs> suggestion to the youth. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you fan panelists, and thank you audience online and in person as well for, for your amazing questions. I hope you found this conversation fruitful and exciting as I did. I'm gonna pass it over back to Erin uh, to take us through the rest of the agenda for today. Let's give the panelists a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Gerald, Cassandra, Abi, Yasser, for your sharing your stories and for taking part in our panel discussion today. And again, thank you to Dion for moderating as well. And of course, thank you to our audience for all your questions. I would now like to invite Amy Ho, Director of Sustainability at the National University of Singapore and member of our steering committee this year to come to the stage and give the closing remarks. SBS, uh, Mr. Bay and King, um, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, draw this uh, occasion to end close. Um, Aaron will follow later with some administrative details to ask all the youths to come apply for uh, the Sustainability Exchange Season 3. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, about season three, not just because I'm, you know, in the steering committee uh, together with uh, Dr. Avil, but because uh, the organizers, which is mainly uh, just Deanne and Aaron, and they've put in so much work into this, but they have actually uh, took all the, the inputs and the feedback uh, from the past season uh, participants and also, you know, infuse it, yeah, to make this season three uh, a lot more exciting. Building on the very successful mentorship program program that has been a cornerstone for the past two seasons. What they've also uh, done is that they, they kind of ensured that there would be a vibrant exchange, that the youth participants, you know, would be exposed to the best practices uh, in the marketplace, in the government sector, uh, and also, uh, you know, be aware of the emerging uh, innovations uh, that they can uh, take and incorporate into the proposals. 
And um, as mentioned earlier, uh, there is now, uh, thanks to the uh, MSE Eco Fund, uh, the three capacity building workshops where participants could bounce off their ideas yeah, and refine their proposals before submitting. And for this season, um, I think they've also extended uh, the period that the participants could work on the proposals from the initial three months to a longer six months. So it will be the expectation is higher that, you know, we are looking, you know, for uh, solutions uh, that would be more considered, that will be more rigorous. And I'm sure that a lot of the youth participants would rise up to the occasion. Yeah. And the third component is to enhance the networking uh, opportunities because, um, you know, you're not just... Uh, the youth uh, participants uh, will not just be able to interact uh, with their uh, industry or government uh, mentors, but at the uh, CSO exchange, they will be able to meet a broader yeah, uh, panel of uh, chief sustainability officers as well as sustainability professionals. So all of this are you know, um, meant to equip uh, the participants, uh, so that you know they can be more confident, yeah, uh, when presenting their uh, proposals uh, at the finals, yeah. And um, as part of the steering committee, we've also you know brainstormed quite a bit about what the problem statements uh, for season three would be like. Uh, I think uh, we loosely based on the Skills Future Singapore report on uh, the green economy and the jobs that will be available out there. But we also took into account what are some of the topics of interest yeah, uh, to the use uh, relating to sustainable living, relating to you know, uh, pertinent uh, engineering or even uh, social issues uh, out there. And uh, we heard also from the past participants that they may want a little bit more flexibility in formulating uh, their own problem statements. So that particular consideration is so infused uh, in season three. So all in all, you can see that, you know, it's uh, a, uh, there's no a better opportunity than to take part uh, in uh, season three. Um, I've also been a judge uh, in the past season, so I've been impressed by the uh, um, proposals. Not only were they uh, innovative, um, but there was a lot of rigor. There was a lot of uh, research that went into it, and it's grounded by uh, industry feedback. Yeah, so I'm expecting to see, you know, uh, similar or if not even, yeah, better applications uh, and proposals this time. So I just want to close by just encouraging all the use, you know, to be bold, yeah? When you apply, be bold in coming up uh, with the problem statements and what you want to tackle, you know? Uh, they may not be uh, easy solutions, uh, but think out of the box, push the boundaries if you can, yeah? I also encourage you, you know, to dig deeper, yeah? Don't, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, go beyond uh, uh, the whys, the what ifs, and look at, you know, the issue from different angles, yeah. And uh, as many of the uh, discussants and the panel members have brought up, uh, is to be open, to be open to uh, diverse views, yeah, appreciate what every member in your group will bring to the table, yeah, and then involve, involve the multiple stakeholders, yeah. Go, you know, beyond, seek, you know, unconventional views and, um, you know, uh, question, you know, uh, why not? Yeah. So I hope that, you know, uh, this particular season, we will even see, you know, m a greater number of uh, applications. Yeah. And I hope that uh, all of you, you know, would have fun. Yeah. Uh, would enjoy the journey. Uh, and um, yeah, come on board, please. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy, very much for your closing remarks. And thank you to all of our speakers who have joined us today. And of course, to our guest of honor, SPS for Sustainability and the Environment, Mr. Bayam Kang, for sharing today and for being part of the event. I'm excited to now announce the official call for applications for season three of Sustainability Exchange. For all interested youths and mentors, if you'd like to find out more about the program and the criteria and also to submit your application, uh, please head over to the EB Impact website or you can also scan the QR code that you see on the screen. Applications are open from now until 4th of April. 
As mentioned by Diane and Amy as well, and some of our speakers today, in addition to the mentorship pillar, we're also excited to introduce the capacity building workshops as part of the mentorship program to further upskill and support the participating youth in their sustainability journeys. For our alumni participants and the wider community, we also look forward to building an alumni network and deepen the connections forged throughout the last two seasons of Sustainability Exchange. Um, you can learn more about the program and more details about these different pillars by visiting us on our website uh, or again by scanning the QR code on the screen. I'd like to again thank our strategic partners, Meta, SG EcoFund, and OCBC Bank, as well as the Climate Action Singapore Alliance for their continuous support in this program. We would also like to thank our knowledge partners for this season and our steering committee members from the National University of Singapore, the Singapore University of Social Sciences, the Cambridge Centre for Advanced Research and Education in Singapore, uh, the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions and Eco-Business for lending us your expertise and knowledge to support the development of season three. Lastly, again, we'd like to extend a big, big thank you to Tomasek Shophouse uh, for being our venue sponsors for this event and the program and for providing this space for us today. I hope that our guests, both in person and online, who are with us, have learned something this afternoon and have been inspired to participate in the upcoming season. We've come to the end of the event and I'd like to open up the floor for the networking session. Uh, for our in-person guests, drinks and snacks are available at the back to the left. Thank you all, have a lovely evening and great weekend ahead.